All right, guys, today we're continuing on our theme, focusing on Philippians chapter 1. We're talking about the idea of real life, and we're looking today about this idea of living out our purpose. When we think about real life and living out our purpose, I, I dealt with this message specifically because we're recognizing graduates today, and when you look at these kids who are graduating from high school and kids who are graduating from college and law school and med school, and you think about the future that's in front of them and all the exciting things that they have, there's a lot of exciting things, but how many of us would really like to go back to all the struggle and hurt and heartache that happens when you're 18 and 19 years old? Maybe we would, maybe we wouldn't, I don't know, but there's a lot of challenges in front of those kids. There's a lot of struggle that's in front of those kids, and it's good stuff, but it's stuff, and it's some heartaches, and so when we look at this and we think about how do we navigate some of the challenges in front of us for our life and our journey, living out our purpose, what does that look like? How do we manifest that in our journey? When we think about this, I'm going to talk about three things today and how we, how we make this happen and how we engage with this. And the first one is this idea. And I think it's so important for our younger generation to, to connect with this is to understand the importance of remaining engaged in a community of faith. We're talking about the Apostle Paul and the letter that he wrote to the church at Philippi. And in this letter that he wrote to the church at Philippi, he was obviously encouraging them it was a joyful letter. It was a letter of exhortation. It was a letter of support. It was a letter of all kinds of different emotions. But one of the pieces of his letter is the fact that he was intimately connected with them. He knew them as individuals. He knew them as people. He was engaged with them on a, on a daily basis in such a way that he knew who they were. When we walk through this journey of life, and we think about how we can be engaged in a community of faith. I want you to think about the importance and the value of being connected in this community. The scripture says this in 122, Philippians 1 verse 22. The scripture says, if I'm going to go on living in this body, this is going to mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is far more necessary for you that I remain in the body. The Apostle Paul is torn with this idea of, yes, do I pursue my life and continue living, knowing the struggle, knowing the hurt, knowing the heartache, and knowing what could happen in a moment's notice when Rome changes its mind in terms of his imprisonment. His hope is to live and his hope is to go on, but he is ready he is ready to die if that ultimately is what's going to happen. He recognizes that his life, his purpose involves fruitful labor. That means making a difference. It involves continuation in his relationship with them and going forth. This, this message that Paul has, we know that his purpose was such that his job, his task was to be the the voice to the Gentile world. His voice was to go outside of the Jewish community and tell people about Jesus. And he did that with great leadership and great insight and great wisdom and direction. But in every place that he went, he was connected to a group of followers of Christ, whether that was in Rome, Colossae, Philippi, or Thessalonica, wherever it might have been, he was connected. I'm going to ask the microphone folk, if you can back me down just a little bit. I'm getting a little bit hot up here with, this, uh, with my microphone, if you would. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 25, the scripture says this, Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and your joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. When you think about what your purpose might be, whether you're 17 or 18, whether you're 23 or 24, whether you're 35, 36, whatever age you might find yourself, when you consider what your purpose might be and what the community of faith might do, this is a place where you can find some direction, where you can find some connection, where you can find some belonging, where you can find some community and connectedness. This is what God has equipped us with to be connected. And Paul is saying, Paul is indicating that it was so important for him to stay connected, that maybe, just maybe, this might be something significant for us in this journey. For just a second, I want you to think about these kids that were standing before me just a moment ago. And I want you to consider how technology has changed their understanding of life and experience. Think about it. 
These kids, they know a whole other language of communication through texting, through Twitter, through all of the 140 characters that they can send out. They can send messages that we cannot interpret if we speak Spanish or English or whatever language we might speak. There's all kinds of languages being communi communicated in that, in that texting language. They've learned that. They've learned an interactive experience of education through virtue of the, of, the, of the iPads and the tablets. When they go to study, they don't just study what the teacher might say, what the book might say. They have the internet that opens up the world to them. When they go into a classroom, they don't study with 10 kids or 15 kids or 20 kids. Their classroom can be the entire world. My wife's teaching a class right now with 26 students online. They live everywhere. And she's teaching them Spanish. They're calling in to recite their Spanish on a Google line that she downloads what they're saying and hears what they're saying so she can grade, grade their pronunciation and things of that nature. They're not in the classroom. They're in their homes and they're learning in that capacity. They don't need to memorize things. They need their phone. Look at Google. Type something in. Speak something in. Whatever. And maybe one of these days they'll be able to think it in there. I don't know. And Google tells them the answer. And you hear what the Google has to say. But you know, when you think about all this stuff about Google, and Google's a fascinating tool, and the technology is a fascinating tool, I, I saw a church sign this week that I thought kind of speaks to this. Look what this message is. There's some questions that can't be answered by Google. Somebody read that faster than me. And we think about, we think about the questions that can't be answered by Google, about belonging, about community, about faith, about hope about trust, about love, about life. There are a host of questions that you're not going to be able to find on the technological spectrum that you're going to find it in a community of faith. I saw another great picture this week, and I hope it doesn't apply here. Do you want to know what hell is? Come listen to our preacher. That's another one. We'll, we'll have to f figure that one out later. And this message, Tom really liked that one. But when we think about what our church is and what our church is to look like, this, this message sends sends a profound statement. Church, it's a human connection of love. It's not a building. It's a lifestyle, not a weekly activity. It's an act of service, not a service that we attend. We live in an extraordinarily hyper-connected world, and in our hyper-connectivity, we are almost totally disconnected from people all around us. We live in lives that are extremely busy at work with other responsibilities, and we struggle to find meaningful relationships and connection. We live in a world where we've almost lost the idea of caring, of tenderness, of kindness, and mercy. Maybe the body of Christ, maybe the church community is a place where we can live out the real life, living with purpose, and remain engaged in a community of faith. The scripture says in Hebrews chapter 10, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another as all the more as you see the day approaching. What does this look like? What does this benefit me? How can this benefit you? As you're sitting back and you're hearing a preacher talk, yes, you need to be in church. Well, that's kind of self-serving for me to say that. Of course it is. But the reality is when you start thinking about the benefit of your involvement, of your connection, of your investment in this place, what good is it for you? Well, ask Henry Peters that. Talk to Henry Peters this week who's lost his wife. And when he was at the hospital at her deathbed, who was he with? People in this room. Call Sally Hagenhoff. And ask her what people have said since the passing of her husband, the messages, the affir affirmation, the comfort, the strength. Look around you and you can see some other people who've walked through some hard valleys and difficult places and they'll tell you the benefit and the blessing of being connected. When we try to figure out our real life and our purpose, part of it is understanding the importance of being connected in a community of faith. Second thing, we want to do real life. We want to live a life worth purpose. Friends, we've got to find whatever that purpose might be for us. I wish these kids who stood before us, they knew exactly what God wanted them to do. I wish they knew what their, their whole future was. My guess is they might have a clue, but I know statistically their plans and their, their goals are going to change about four or five times in the next four or five years as they process through education. Most of you, who are in the, in the business world, the education world, wherever you might be serving, your professional path is going to change directions multiple times. What's your purpose? What's your overall purpose for being here and engaging in this life and engaging in this world and making a difference for the kingdom of heaven? 
The scripture says this in Philippians 1.20. It says, I eagerly expect and I hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. We know Paul's purpose was to preach the gospel to the Gentile world. We know Paul's purpose was to take the gospel of Jesus all around the Roman Empire. We know that Paul's purpose was to glorify Jesus, that the chief end of his life was honoring Christ. When we think of Jesus and Paul's life, we understand that Jesus was at the beginning, Jesus was at the continuation, and Jesus was at the very end of Paul's journey. Jesus for the apostle Paul was his inspiration, he was his continuation, he was the very end of his life. And Paul's statement, I don't want to be put to shame. I want to be faithful, I want to live strong, I want to finish well, I want to do my task well. That's the message that Paul is conveying. When we consider this in Philippians 1.23, we see that Paul is torn. He knows his life is in jeopardy in that Roman prison. He knows his life is in, in threat as he's chained to a Roman guard. He knows that there are people who want him dead. And he understands that if he dies, well, that's, that's okay because he's going to heaven. But the reality is it's also very important for him to live so that he can be a blessing to the people that he's trying to reach, whether they're in Philippi, Colossae, Thessalonica, Ephesus, Galatia, wherever, that his message, his hope, he understands his purpose, and it's real. Last Friday, I told you last Sunday, Veronica and I had the opportunity to go to the Pentagon and see a man promoted from major to lieutenant colonel. There was a general who spoke and did his thing, and the general was really, really good. But one of his buddies, I'm assuming a civilian worker, was there, and this civilian read a prayer. And I asked the, the fellow if I could have a copy of this prayer because I want to read this prayer that he read. And I want you to hear how this individual see, sees or he saw the, the purpose of our friend Danny when he wrote this prayer. He wrote this, Father, we know that when you made Danny... You broke the mold, for you gifted him with a good heart, a warm smile, a pleasing personality. And if that weren't enough, you also adorned him with great leadership, loyalty, and commitment to serve others. In your word, you said, let those who wish to be great among you, let him first be the servant. And that describes Danny, a servant leader. Father, it is in light of these great qualities that you've seen fit to promote him to the next rank. For we know that all promotions come from you. May your hand continue to be on his life and service to you, to our nation, to our Air Force, as he accepts his new rank. Friends, that, that friend of his, and I don't have a clue what his name is, he could see the purpose that Danny was living life as, a, as an officer in the Air Force. What's your purpose? Where you work, where you teach, where you study, where you live. Where you're engaged, what's your purpose? What are you doing to make a difference for the kingdom of heaven? Yes, I want you to succeed in business. Yes, I want you to be a great banker. Yes, I want you to be a great teacher. But as followers of Christ, there's something bigger in our journey than just that. In fact, the scripture says this, that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who's called you out of darkness and into his wonderful life. Friends, we are chosen. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are a people belonging to God. Why? So we can tell others about Jesus. So that we can live a life that reflects the Messiah. That we can live a life that honors, honors him in such a way that is profound. I want to introduce you to a young lady. Her name is Katie Davis. She was 19 years old, graduated from a high school in Brentwood, Tennessee, went on a mission trip, a, a gap year mission trip. She was going to Uganda for one year to work in an orphanage. She got into this orphanage in Uganda and realized her calling in life was not to go back to Brentwood, Tennessee and go to college, but her calling in life was to take care of children. This 19-year-old girl called her parents and said, Mom and Dad, I'm not going home. I'm staying. And she adopted 13 little girls. It was illegal at that time for a person under the age of 25 to adopt a child, so they became her foster children until she turned 25. She started a ministry called a Mazina Ministry, and each year this now 25-year-old young lady raises about three-quarters of a million dollar, dollars to feed 2,500 children and house almost 500 children in Uganda. 
That's an 18, 19 year old kid from Brentwood, Tennessee, who goes on a mission trip and finds out what God's got in store for her. If I were her parents, I would not have liked that at all. Lauren, don't get any ideas. But you see this young lady living out her purpose. This friend of mine sitting in the front, kneeling next to my daughter Lauren, her name is Carolyn. Carolyn was 50 years old, a recent widow, civil servant, done her job, done her job well, but hadn't done too many things that exciting and didn't really know what, what was going on for life, was ready to retire in a few years, but realized there needed to be something a little bit more to this life. She went and watched her daughter serve in various capacities all around the world and all kinds of different organizations, and she thought, you know, maybe God can use me. She went to Guatemala with her, her daughter and saw some things that she wanted to invest in, and 10 years ago, she and her daughter went back to Guatemala just to look around and see what they can do. They landed in a little city called Antigua. They found a need for building houses, providing clean water, feeding children, and a variety of different things. And that young lady of 51, 52 years old at this point began a ministry going to Guatemala to provide housing, water, and food for children in Guatemala. For the last 10 years, that's what she's been pouring her life for. That's what she's been investing her life in. That's the direction that she's been going. 21 years ago, the fella in that picture arrived at my house one morning at 5 o'clock in the morning. His wife had announced her desire to end their relationship. At 5 o'clock in the morning, he had been driving around the community, did not know where to go, but finally came to our door and woke us up at 5 o'clock on a Sunday morning, poured out his heart, weeping, crying, not knowing what direction to go. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. We processed through that mess, and in the course that followed that, he told me, he said, David, when I was a 19-year-old man, I understood God was calling me to be a medical missionary. I didn't know where he was calling me to go, but I went to, went to seminary, got the seminary education, went to med school, got the medical education, and got busy, busy with my medical practice, and I never, never picked up the idea of being a medical missionary again. He said, it's time for me at age 50, 51 to start doing this properly, and this medical professional, this much-loved county physician, country doctor, hundreds and hundreds of patients started a ministry in Honduras where he provided all that you need for, to run a hospital on, in Honduras, developed a partnership with the Medical College of Virginia, has taken dozens and dozens of first and second and third year residents on the foreign mission field to serve in a variety of capacities. For the past 20 years, he's done incredible things in fulfilling his purpose and understanding his purpose. I don't know what age you are. But I hope in some place, in some way, in some capacity, you understand what your purpose might be. Your purpose not just in, in living and breathing and eating and sleeping and going about life, but there is something bigger in this life that you are created to be and to do and to make happen. We see this image of what real life looks like and trying to live out our purpose. And there's a third step for those of us who are followers of Jesus. It's this idea of simply living our faith, of taking step by step in honoring Christ, of taping one decision after another decision, of one choice after another choice, whether we're in college, we're at work, we're at home, we're wherever we are, that we're making a decision to honor Christ. The scripture says, whatever happens, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whatever goes on, in Paul's life, whether he lives or dies, whatever happens to me, you Philippians, you keep doing what the right thing might be. You do the right thing. This language, conduct yourselves, Paul is borrowing from a political, political word. In the, in the town of Philippi, that's a Roman colony. And when he uses the language, conduct yourself, that is reminding them that in the town of Philippi there were Roman citizens, and Roman citizens acted like they were aristocrats. They spoke Latin. They dressed in Roman customs. They spoke to leaders with Roman ways, and you could see the difference. And the freedmen and the slaves and the vanquished people, they looked at the Romans and they didn't really care for them because they carried their aristoc aristocracy on their nose or on their shoulder. So when they conducted themselves as a Roman, it wasn't necessarily a good thing. Paul says to the church at Philippi, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Conduct yourself in a manner worthy 
of being a follower of Jesus with the love and the tenderness and the mercy and the gentleness and the capacity to stand for what you understand. Paul says to them, you are going to suffer. You are going to go through some difficult, difficult times. There's going to be some challenges. That suffering that we experience, it's a part of our journey. I wish we could say that suffering evaporates when you become a follower of Christ, and that is so, so not true. Every person is going to have a scar. Every person is going to have some hurts. Every person is going to have struggles. Jesus does not take the suffering away. Jesus makes the suffering a bit more bearable. In fact, the scripture says in Matthew chapter 11, are you worn out? Are you tired? Are you burned out? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me. Work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't let anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. We are going to have challenges. We are going to have struggles. We are going to have issues that knock us down. We have Jesus. But we also have this community of faith. Friends, you are going to get knocked down. You are going to have problems. You're going to have struggles. I wish you wouldn't, but you are. I am. The beauty of being a follower of Christ is twofold. One, run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Two, He's equipped people to go with you. Somebody sitting near you, somebody sitting next to you, somebody that you call mom or dad or brother or sister, but he's equipped the body of Christ to walk alongside when life knocks you down, that you can do real life and fulfill your purpose that he's equipped you to do. Would you pray with me, please? Father, your servant said, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Your servant wrote that we should live such lives among this world that people could see that we are followers of Jesus. Lord, he also told us that we were going to have struggles, that we were going to sorrow and suffer. Father, in the midst of all this, help us to be people who reflect Jesus wherever we go, wherever we are. Forgive us when we don't do that. Help us, Father God, to take it serious. Help us to be found faithful. And when we're knocked down and when we fall in, Father, we pray that you send some people, some person alongside to help us get up and finish the race. That your spirit might equip and enable and equip and allow us to press on. Father, speak. Speak to our hearts and help us to be found faithful to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.